Good morning, and uh, welcome to the Desert Zen Center. Um, it's good to see new faces, uh, and uh, I think I'm going to start by just quickly doing a little uh, quick information on the Buddha about his life and his story. Uh, just so we all have a baseline of his key teachings. Uh, the, uh, he was a man who lived 2,600 years ago. And depending on your translator or archaeologist, either in northern India or southern Nepal. But in any way, the geography is in the foothills of the, uh, the Himalaya mountains. And uh, his key teachings uh, revolved around his koan, which is a Japanese term, which is a, uh, a, a great question. And the great question he had, that he spent his life trying to discover the answer to, and finding the answer, and then teaching others for the rest of his life was the question of why do we suffer? And his most well-known uh, teachings revolve around his <clears throat> enlightenment experience where uh, after a certain uh, uh, travails and a life of a traveling wandering mendicant, a spiritual mendicant, uh, in the, the, the forests of India, uh, he uh, sat for one determined period and in an instant was awakened to the answer to his question. The Four Noble Truths. Suffering exists. That's dukkha. Uh, there's a cause to suffering, and that cause to suffering, suffering the, the, uh, the word, uh, the Sanskrit word is trishna, which is thirst, craving, and there's a flip side to that, like many things in Buddhism. Uh, the, uh, you can crave the good things in life and spend your time missing the present moment, or you can be avoiding all the bad things and miss out on the present moment. So it's kind of a two-sided coin there, this idea of the cause of our suffering. The third noble truth is niroda, which is to blow out. It's the literal term of that. There are many translations or ideas around that term, but Basically, it comes down to what do we do to get the suffering to stop? So that's three. And the fourth is marga, is the is the, the word in Sanskrit. And marga means path, and that's what we are all on here today. The path is uh, uh, as he goes on to define time of his enlightenment, the Eightfold Path. Now this path is his prescription for how we suffer less and become happier people. Uh, and through this path, all, if we suffer less, we are also enlightened to the idea of ways that we are suffering and suffering affects others and so that others will suffer less and there'll be a fast improvement in our lives and in the world. The Eightfold Path is right view and right view is basically trying to see the world as it truly is without uh, uh, the delusions that come up with uh, into our lives that I'll talk about a little later, and 
uh, uh, see a clear idea of uh, what the real conditions on the ground are in this moment. So right view is very important because it affects our ideas and our approach to the rest of the path. So right view, right intention, so nothing happens in our world without thought. Our mind is the primary tool we use to live, to be in the world. That's right intention, that's the second one. Right speech, so before we blurt something out that's untoward or inappropriate, we are encouraged to be just a bit in front of that with our thought. So that's right view, uh, right, I mean right speech, and then that translates to right action, same sort of thing. Before we act, understand and try to see how this might cause someone to suffer, might cause us ultimately to suffer. So working back through the mind as it moves out into our world. Uh, so right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood. We would want to do something on a daily basis, our job uh, in particular here, or what we do to sustain, sustain ourselves in the world. That needs to be that needs to be grounded in right intention, in right view, uh, and then uh, uh, right uh, livelihood, right effort. So we want to be honest with ourselves about giving it a good effort, uh, a, a right uh, a mindfulness. Now we get into the areas of understanding our mind and how it works to give us that window of opportunity through our meditation to intercept things that might cause us to suffer, that might cause others to suffer. We need a gap. We need a space. We need to stop in a moment and understand our, what, what our impulse is and how does it fit into the circumstances that are presented to us. The, uh, uh, the, the, this, this happens in our meditation. This is the reason Buddhists meditate, is to cultivate this idea uh, or understanding of the mind and how it works. That starts in this area with right mindfulness, and then, it's the, working together with mindfulness is concentration, right concentration or right samadhi. And this is a deepening of our meditation that actually gets us to the point where we can incorporate this idea into our life uh, ha and have an impact on our lives and the lives of those around us. And that's why meditation is so important to us here in the world of Zen Buddhism. Zen is the meditation school of Buddhism. Now, in my mind, there's one idea, and it's a big one, that the Buddha discovered prior to his enlightenment. And it's it, it seems so simple, it seems almost like common sense, but it is very powerful and very important to the rest of Buddhism because it, it, it is a lot, it has a lot to do with this idea that there are two different uh, sides to each and everything we encounter in the world. Uh, so the idea here at a very high level is dukkha transforms into samsara which is suffering that is continuous it's the it's the thoughts in your head that never stop coming into your head they make that loop that that we try to in buddhism want to break through 
and get an awareness of, and then get a bit of understanding in. So this, this, this is really important because the idea the Buddha came, had came from his life experience. And the, his life experience prior to his enlightenment was seven to ten years of wandering around in the forest uh, without much clothing, without much to eat, and doing things that were uh, in an effort and at the time uh, thought to be the key to your spiritual awakening, which was a rejection of the body. So people would uh, uh, starve the body, uh, harm the body. This was part of the practice uh, that they were involved in. And it darn near killed the Buddha. He was, he was existing on uh, several grains of rice a day. He was uh, uh, not in any condition to even sit up. And in fact, he was lucky in a way because he was discovered by a shepherdess, Sujata. Sujata came across him. She'd seen him in the forest and recognized that the man was dying. Uh, uh, and gave him some goat's milk to restore him and then helped build his energy back through her family, helped her to feed and get him back on his feet, literally again, so he could get back on his feet and then begin his spiritual quest anew with some new information. And what came out of this great suffering is a prelude to his earlier life. He was, if you will, part of the 1% of his day. His father was a prince and, uh, and, or a, a, a governor. Uh, they had a good deal of wealth and privilege within Indian society. They were part of the warrior clan. So you can see there's two different, uh, different results and experiences that the Buddha had in his life. And what he came to understand was that what was important for our development and for our survival is a cultivation of something he called the middle way. The middle way rejects the extremes of lavish luxury or uh, uh, great su physical suffering in the woods, uh, you know, wandering uh, and, and denying every physical uh, 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 pleasure. Uh, so the, the middle way is throughout Buddhism. It, it's really kind of the north star of Buddhism, if you would. Uh, and, and that's really, in my mind, the, a nutshell, in a nutshell, the teachings of the Buddha. Now, to shift gears a little bit, uh, we, just like you, uh, I, uh, and I'm assuming this because of what's in the world these days, we had a little bit of a conversation before about how things have progressed over the last uh, two years or so, where there's war uh, busting out all over the place, and it seems pretty uh, uh, important and unique and uh, frightening. And it makes us anxious. Uh, I personally track it a bit to the ideas of the suffering going on in the Ukraine. And then this October, uh, the whole thing was amped up by what's going on in the Middle East. And everybody's on edge about the whole thing, uh, myself included. And uh, Roshi gave a talk uh, that was based on the, a line in the Dharmapada, which is the teachings of the Buddha. And uh, it said basically, I think, uh, that the world is on fire. And that got me to thinking a little bit 
And uh, like many people, or maybe not, you, you might all be much more evolved than I am, thankfully. Uh, I, I spend too much time scrolling for news information. Uh, I, I, I recently retired over the last two years and uh, truth be told, I uh, probably wasted a lot of time there, uh, especially when you add in things like uh, uh, various social media sites like Facebook and some, uh, something else that's new that you may have here called Nextdoor, which is uh, a, a a, a localized version of a, kind of a Facebook uh, people in your area. Anyway, I, I started to really just think about, well, you know, there's a lot of pressure to, to basically uh, see the world in apocalyptic terms and be very frightened and anxious about what the heck's going on. I'm 68 years old, and uh, uh, if you are from that era, and you think a little bit, uh, my, my early schooling was, uh, I was an elementary student from the second grade to the sixth grade at Holy Trinity Elementary School in San Pedro, California. And uh, I wanted to be a priest. Uh, I was an altar boy. I was a very serious student. I was a very serious little kid. Uh, and I was kind of paying attention to what the heck was going on. Uh, in, in world events for whatever reason. And I remember in 1962, approximately, uh, about 61 years ago, uh, during my first uh, semester at Holy Trinity, the nuns were, we had a new fun thing to do in class before first recess, and that was to crawl under our desk and uh, put our hands up over our head uh, because something bad might happen and you, that, you'd know that that was coming because uh, there'd be an alarm, there'd be a siren that you'd hear. Well, you really can't fool a seven-year-old. I mean, they figure stuff out pretty fast. And in the context of what's happening now, you can see we, we like to look at time as on a timeline. It's a line. And we're always looking at this side of the line, and our memory doesn't really want us to look back at that side of the line, because that's over with, that's done. What's, what's going on now is what's important, and what's going ha to happen in the future? That's really something I need to pay attention to. So, we start in 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then by 1963, I'm really worried. I'm an eight-year-old now. And the president has been shot in public in Dallas, Texas. I remember the day Oswald got shot, right? His, his uh, uh, individual who was uh, a suspect in his murder on national television, right? In the Dallas police station or courthouse in transit to see a judge. It was a rainy day in San Pedro. I just <laughs> went into my bedroom and thought, this, this is not good. This is it. This is trouble. And then by 1965, things have improved. A little something called the Watts Riot. You can look out the backyard of my parents' house in San Pedro and see a glow over the Union Oil Refinery. That was Watts on fire. My father, who was a pharmaceutical representative at the time, had the territory of Watts, called on doctors over there. He was in the park where it started at noon, and at 3 o'clock, everything started to happen at that park. So he was pretty lucky to get out of there and get home. Uh, and then Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King and the 68 uh, and the 1968 Democratic Convention. You see where I'm going with this, okay? Yeah, it's bad now, and it may be next level bad, but sometimes we get that pers 
perspective that's important to us. And sometimes we forget about it. And so I've spent the better part of the last 18 months, you know, looking through news feeds and, and feeling, uh, uh, feeling detached from the world because the, the news was so, well, overwhelming. And I sit my meditation morning and night like I normally do. It gives me a bit of comfort and insight, but then I kind of pick up where I left off. And I, Roshi's talk about the, uh, the world is on fire got me to that spot. And I figured, hey, you know, I probably need to spend less time on these new sites, <laughs> and uh, started to dial that back a little bit, because you know they, they, you don't trust anybody if you spend enough time there. You really don't. Uh, I told, I talked about Nextdoor. That's a local uh, 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 forum for people who are. I don't know if you watched Bewitched in the '60s. There, everybody seems to be Mrs. Kratz. They're reporting their neighbors and. Kids on e-bikes are pretty much the direct equivalent of Satan. Uh, everybody on these sites sees a threat, and sometimes they've got pictures of threats, and they've got things that, well, they seem th pretty threatening to me, and they're right around my neighborhood. So that doesn't really help. So for the month of October, I after this thing in... in in uh, Israel it started up. I just started to dial back my place and all those things. But one of the last things I did, which was kind of fortunate, uh, because I don't even remember where it was. It was either on Facebook or it was on Nextdoor. And it was a little ad that caught my eye. And the ad, and, and I've got some spare time on my hands being a retired person right now. And the ad uh, was for crossing guards. And uh, I thought, what the hell? They had a, you could click and give me your information and, you know, you're probably too old or you're probably too, I, I don't know, it, don't worry about it, just fill it out and whatever. Well, a, m a month went by, so I must have done that even before this thing in Israel. So this is in September when I do this. And nothing happens for a month. And then out of the blue, a call. Did you sign up to be a crossing guard? And I thought to myself, well, yeah, I did. Well, what's up? And uh, so uh, there was an interview that morning, and uh, everything seemed to go pretty well. I passed the background check. Uh, and uh, three days later, I, I got my no yellow robe, but I got my yellow vest and my yellow hat and my giant stop sign. And uh, it's going pretty good. I mean, I, I've been working since early October. And I'm an alternate. I, I don't have my own corner. <laughs> You know, I just go when people call in and say, I'm sick, or it's too hot, or I don't want to go down there, or whatever. So I've worked three or four different schools over the last month, and uh, it's a joy. It's an utter joy. Uh, the kids are some of the most sweet, reasonable, intelligent little people I've ever seen. And they're right there in the crosswalk, and they're rightly, thanks, sir. Thank you very much. I mean, it's it's pretty darn close to Leave It to Beaver, you know. It's uh, and the parents are very nice, and the 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 people who are the troublemakers in their cars are, are very cognizant of school children and crosswalks and people who are escorting them. And you know, the crazy thing about it, when I think about it, is you all know this that. You don't even need a crosswalk. You push the button, you watch the light, you go across. What's this guy doing here? Really? Really? And the truth of the matter is, people respond. They respond to other people. They thank them. 
They say hi. They say have a nice weekend. A week ago Friday, I got an otter pop. Some kid runs up. Hey, Mr. Sir, this is for you. Hands me the otter pop. I never had an otter pop in my life. I was pretty stoked. But you can't eat on the job. So I waited till I crossed back over on the other side and it had halfway melted by that time it was so hot and finished my otter pop. And luckily it didn't get reported. But the mom was hilarious. She was pushing a stroller with his bigger brother across the street. She looks over her shoulder at me and says, uh, yeah, it's the otter pop. It's been opened, but we haven't done anything to it. <laughs> so I took the, the there was a uh, there was a uh, some space of trust there, so I went ahead and ate it. Uh, but once again, it, you get you know, it, it's it's not the volunteering because it's the, because I get sixteen dollars an hour, and I work a whole five hours a week, uh, or maybe ten if it's really a, an important week and a lot of people are out. So yeah, it, it, the the idea of doing something in your community is a great thing. And this has been a great personal example for me uh, going forward. And it's right up there with taking the time to cultivate your meditation practice and do all the good things. Read about Buddhism. Read and study uh, the Buddha's commentaries uh, and, and all sorts of other things that make a full practice of Buddhism and, and, and make it really... Uh, uh, live for me, uh, but uh, it, it, it's been uh, it's been a real uh, it's it's been a tonic, <laughs> uh, and uh, once again there is so much that we uh, we can give to each other when we get with each other when we. Uh, uh, interact with each other, when we serve each other, when we help each other, when we have compassion for everyone, because we are everyone. All we're doing in our crosswalk, in our crosswalk is breaking down this idea that the crossing guard is separate. Like I said earlier, he's totally superfluous. One last story. There's one location in the schools around where I live where there is no light and it's on a pretty dangerous windy road that takes its toll of motorcycle riders and people driving their sports cars way too fast but there's no light there it's just a crosswalk uh, and uh, I uh, it's pretty low volume <laughs> Uh, I'll be there for 45 minutes and cross three people. So, uh, I, and I was, Friday, I was there, and uh, I, uh, I crossed three people. But the fourth pedestrian was a woman riding a very large and beautiful horse. A, a white and black horse that was really a, just a gorgeous horse and she needed to come across the road to go to the general store and she squared up on the other side of the crosswalk and gave me one piece of advice which is be very slow and deliberate with that sign <laughs> she didn't want me to spook her horse and so I stepped out put the sign up, motion to stop the traffic, and the horse came across the crosswalk. And uh, uh, I guess, I'm not sure I have to check this out, because one of the biggest troubles for a crossing guard is people who don't want to follow the rules about walking their bike. And I don't know if a horse is a vehicle or not, but I may have been in violation there in addition to the otter pop by not having her get off the horse. But I think that would have been a big mess because I probably would have had to help her get back on the horse. Thank you so much.